Okay, I have like a little question for you guys. What, what does everybody have that can change the world, but not everyone knows they have it? No, come on. Okay, I didn't want to have to use this. I want to keep it for myself, but I have a $10 Dutch Bros gift card for anyone who answers this right. <laughs> what is something that everyone has that can change the world, but not everyone knows they have it? <laughs> okay, it starts in in and ends in ends. Starts in in and ends with ends. Someone said internship. <laughs> no, it starts with in and ends with ends. Okay, I heard a couple of people say influence, so the first person up here gets it. Hey, you didn't say influence. Hey, whoever said influence. No, no, I heard someone over here, someone back there. No one wants $10? No one, no one wants $10? Okay. Come on, let's give a round of applause. Okay, so I'm going to be speaking today about influence. And influence is something that we all have, whether you believe it or not. But it's something that, that we all have, and like I mentioned earlier, it's something that can change the world. So influence is uh, some, when you make an impact or change the way someone acts. You know, like recently, like, you know, the water bottle flipping thing. You know, it takes one person to do it, put it online, and the whole world is doing it. Or like the little fidget spinner. You know, one person brought one to school, and now everyone has one. I have one, but <laughs> as Christians, we are called to live an influential life. So that's going to be my first point. We're called to live an influential life. So when, but when you think about it, we all live influential lives. Like, everyone lives an influen influential lives. Like, you know, Justin Bieber, everyone copies what he does. You know, the popular kid at your school, everyone has influential lives. But the thing is, as Christians... We're not called to live ordinary lives. We're called to live extraordinary lives. So the way we have to live is extraordinary, influential life. And the extra doesn't just come just because you're a Christian, but it comes from the way that you act. It comes from the way that you act at school, the way that you treat your parents, the way that you talk to your friends, you know, when you're not at church. That's where the extra comes in, the way that you live outside of church. So, you know, when we, you, know you hear it a lot during... When people get saved, you hear heaven's throwing a party for you in heaven. And they're not throwing a party for you, you know, not because you're up here copying what the, pe the, the pastor says. But they throw a party for you because you're declaring that you're tired of living your old life and you want to start fresh. You want to start a new life with Christ. But nowadays, a lot of people, you know, saying they're a Christian is like saying you're a burrito. Like a lot of people, okay, so like, okay, stay with me. So you could say you're a burrito, right? But, you know, everyone can see you, you don't look like a burrito. You know, you look like a human. You just you act like everyone else. You're not a burrito, right? You're just, you're just like everyone else. So I heard this story a while ago when I was listening to a podcast by Francis Chan. And uh, he, went to, um, he went to a third world country to uh, be a part of a, one of their services. And as he was there, he was paying attention to how they do things. He was watching everyone. And the, he said that it was the most amazing thing he had seen because everyone in the service was worshiping. Everyone was giving their all. They were all praying. They were all worshiping. And they weren't doing it to look good, but they were doing it from the bottom of their hearts. They were doing it with their all, you know, not just, not just praying so that they look good to their neighbor. And, you know, he, after the service, he had stayed around like everyone stayed, no one left. And he was asking them questions. And he had asked one of the, he asked the pastor, he said, we're, we're all the fake Christians, you know, we're all, the, all the, the lukewarm people, the people that aren't really Christians, but they come to church to say they're Christians. And as soon as he said that, the whole church just busted out laughing. Like, it wasn't like, like a little giggle. It was like the funniest joke you've ever heard laughing. Like, they were laughing. And he was, like, sitting there serious, like, like wondering why they're laughing at it. So, after, so he, uh, they all finished laughing, and they were, like, wondering, they're, what do you mean fake Christian? And they explained to him that where they live, to say, to say you're a Christian, it's not just a title. A sacrifice comes with it. Because over there, if you say you're a Christian, people are going to take your land. People are going to steal from you. People are going to humiliate you. You know, there's people that were being persecuted for saying they're Christian. So for them, saying a Christian wasn't just, 
wasn't just something that they say. It was something that came with a sacrifice. Something that, it wasn't just, just a title. It wasn't just to look good. But it was something that came with a sacrifice. And I believe that's how Christians should be living nowadays. That they shouldn't look at Christian as a title. It's not something, it's not just it's not something to, do cool, to be cool, you know. It's not something cool. It's something that comes with a sacrifice. Something that's going to come with your life changing. Not just saying you're a Christian. And some of you, you know, maybe you want to be that person. Maybe you're trying to be that person to be an example for other people. But uh, you're just struggling with it. Like maybe you're the only one that's Christian in your family or in your group of friends. And I want to tell you that God has handpicked the, your family your people around you, he had picked everyone around you so that you could be that positive example in their life, so that you could ch change their lives. And I'm not saying you have to be a perfect example. I'm not saying you have to be, you know, like Pastor Vlad up here. You don't have to be perfect, but you have, I'm not saying he's perfect, but, <laughs> but you don't have to be perfect. You get what I'm saying? You just have to, you have to be willing to continue to strive to be. And you have to be willing and able to represent Christ in your life. So my second point is going to be how to live a godly lifestyle. And my first re reason is everything that you do, everything that you want to do, have God first in your life. So I'm saying like everything that you do, not just when you're at church, not just when you're at home group, or not just preparing for a, com a conference, but you have to have God first in your life. 24 hours, seven days a week. You have to have him first in your life and no matter what you do. You know, in Colossians, I think that's how you pronounce it, 317, it says whatever you do, whether you're a student, whether you're an athlete, or whether you're a musician, you know, it doesn't just stop there. Whether you're a teacher, whether you're a lawyer, whatever you may be, everything that you do, you are to do it unto the Lord and not for people. So, for example, you know, when you're out there on the court, when you're out there on the field, when you're sitting in class, you're not, you're not cussing, you're not yelling at your teammates, you're not yelling at the opponents, but you're setting a good example by the things that you do and the way that you act. And my second, my second reason is going to be seek God to the fullest. So consistent, consi consistency in prayer and Bible reading, it's not going to come easy. You have to constantly be thriving to make it a lifestyle, make it a part of you. You have to push yourself to pray and push yourself to read the Bible even when you're not motivated to, even when you don't feel like it. You know that saying, fake it till you make it? This is the only reason, this is the only time that you can use it. Because, you know, even if you don't feel like it, even if you're not motivated to and you know, your reasons aren't the right reasons to pray, you have to push yourself to pray every single day and push yourself until it becomes a lifestyle. So, come on. So, I used to, I used to try to be consistent in my prayer life, but, you know, I was, it, was, it was hard. I would, my fire would always, uh, my flame would always die out after, like, two days and, like, it was hard to continue to keep praying. <laughs> I'm serious. <laughs> but um, it's hard. Yeah, my fire would go out until eventually God gave me the opportunity to be able to evaluate my life and see that what I do, the things that I do today, are what will make a difference tomorrow. Come on. Repeat after me. What I do today will make the difference tomorrow. All right. So, for example... Uh, when I first started coming to church, I didn't come because I wanted to live a holy lifestyle. I came because my sister made me. I was forced to come to church, and it, it was against my will, and I did not want to come. But if it weren't for that, I wouldn't be where I am today. And when I first started coming, you know, it wasn't for my reasons. It wasn't because I wanted to live a holy lifestyle, but because I was forced to. But once God met my motives... Behind no, God. Once God met me, my motives began to shift. I began to be. I began to start coming. You know, not because I was forced to, not because my sister made me, but because I actually wanted to build a relationship with Christ. Because I wanted to change my life and begin to live a life for Christ. And so once God meets you through your con constant seeking, you will start noticing a shift, and your prayers will begin to bring you closer to God. My favorite part about this is that. Once you become, that once it becomes a part of you, once this happens, once he meets your needs, 
You know, it'll become a lifestyle and it'll be, it'll become easier. But the best part is that all the worldly things, all those things will become the most unattractive thing to you. And, the, and God's will and a godly lifestyle will become the most important thing in your life. And last and most important way to live a godly lifestyle is to surround yourself with the people on the same path and goal, which is to seek a relationship with God. Like it said in 1 Corinthians, bad company corrupts good morals. So no matter how determined you are, no matter how hard you want to try to, be, to start reading your Bible, to start having a relationship, the people that are around you will determine whether it will, they will hit, either hinder you or they will either lift you up. And I'm not telling you like no Christian friends, like only surround yourself with Christian people. But you have to make sure that the time that you spend with your Christian people are, more, are greater than the time you spend with the unchristian. Because once you start spending time, more time with the unchristian friends, that's when they'll begin to hinder you. That's when they'll begin to bring you down and you'll begin to live the, the lifestyle that they're living. So like for me, um, I, sh- I know most of you probably know my testimony, but excuse me. Sorry. <laughs> okay. But uh, in seventh grade, Back then, um, like in sixth grade, I never thought I was gonna. I never thought I would be a person to smoke. I never thought I would be a person to hang around bad people. I was always good, keeping up with my grades. I had not straight A's, but I had good grades, and not, I, I always caught up with my work, and I was always doing good, until eventually I started hanging around these um, two other guys. You know, they were the cool kids in the class, and I started hanging around them. And you know, my time began to increase. I sp- I began to spend more and more time with them. And sooner or later, I began to be like them. I began to talk like them. I began to cuss like them. I played basketball like them. That was good, but I began to be more like them. And eventually, it led into some deeper and darker things. I began to, I began to seek to their approval. I began to want to be like them. And that is what led me to begin to, begin to cuss. That's what led me to start smoking and living that lifestyle and... I didn't, I didn't want to be a part of it until I had seen how, I had seen them doing it, and I had seen how, you know, they were the popular kids, and I wanted to be like that. So then I began to do that stuff. And it wasn't until my sister invited me to church, and I began, began to hang around these people, um, like Zachy and Jacob, you know, they're the biggest part that made me who I am today, because if it weren't for them, I would still be living my life the way that I was, because they helped me see that, you know, living a Christian life, it's not boring, it's not it's not, the Bible isn't a book of th- do this and don't do that. You know, it's a, it's, a, it's a story of someone that died on the cross for you, someone that loves you so much that they literally died on the cross for you. You know, you hear that so much that it's like, it's not a big deal anymore, but really every time you hear it, it should be a bigger and bigger deal because someone literally died for you to be able to, so that you could get to know your father. So, you know, I want to encourage you guys. I want you guys to begin to evaluate your life, to see who are the toxic people in your life that are constantly bringing you down, to see who is keeping you from reaching your full potential, who is keeping you from getting to where you want to be. You know, what's in the way of that? You know, and I don't want you guys to wait for a, for a wake-up call. Don't wait for a wake-up call. Do not wait until, until you get expelled. Do not wait until, you know, your friend, um, your fr- and don't wait until you get a DUI. Don't wait until your friend commits suicide. Don't wait for that. The wake-up call is now. I want you guys to look at your life. Evaluate your life and think to yourself, what is holding me back? What is keeping you from reaching where you want to be? You know, instead of being the person that going at a party and getting a DUI, you can be that person that your friend calls to pick that you, so you can pick them up. You, instead of, you know, instead of waiting till your friend commits suicide, be the person to be there, pray with them. Be the person that's going to be there to pray with them and influence life into them. Instead of waiting to, for, to get expelled, instead of waiting for your friend to get expelled, be the person that influenced them to do better in school. Show them that there's, you know, that there's no point in living a life uh, where you're slacking on everything, where you're slapping on even school. I mean, school is what's going to give you a future. School is what's going to get you uh, a future job. So I want to encourage you guys, evaluate your life. What are you doing today that, that you don't want to be doing tomorrow? 
Who is keeping you from reaching what you want to, to what you want to be tomorrow?